In order to discuss the family in the later Roman Empire, it is necessary to provide a brief overview of the political and economic history of the empire from the reign of the first official imperator Augustus to that of the Emperor Justinian, whose reign marks the transition from Roman to Byzantine culture. As early as the late 4th century BCE, the Roman Republic controlled territories it had conquered and absorbed as imperial acquisitions. The political transformation of Rome from a republic governed by a senate, whose members were appointed by virtue of their election to the position of consul, and an assembly, whose members were elected by the male citizenry, to an empire ruled by a single autocrat who passed his title to his successor through hereditary and dynastic succession, did not occur until Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, was granted the title of Imperator Augustus. Augustus maintained the fiction that the Senate was still the supreme political body, but even that propaganda was abandoned by later successors of his own family, the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which ruled to the year 68 CE. Over the next 200 years or so, the power of the Roman Empire grew as its territory expanded to encompass the entire Mediterranean, Western Europe, and the Isle of Britain. The borders of the empire were vast and difficult to defend. Its culture was eventually a hybrid of customs, traditions, and religions that owed a great debt to the Greek culture that had traveled with Alexander the Great during his own conquests in the 4th century BCE. Indeed, comparatively few people in the Roman Empire spoke Latin as their native or first tongue. People in the southern and eastern Mediterranean spoke mostly Greek, as well as Aramaic and Coptic. In Europe, they spoke a number of different Celtic and Germanic languages. In North Africa, peasants spoke Semitic dialects based on ancient Phoenician, the group that had founded the city of Carthage. Latin was the official language of the empire, the language of its laws and administration. The language of most of its population, however, was usually Greek, the result of the Alexandrian conquests. Even as the Roman Empire expanded and its administration became more effective, cracks began to appear in the political and military institutions that guaranteed the stability known as the Pax Romana. The succession of emperors had always been a problem. From the first century CE, the Roman army began to influence the transfer of power from one imperial dynasty to the next. The period between dynasties tended to be chaotic, and every successive dynasty struggled to sustain its power and influence while still keeping the army occupied and politically disengaged. The army itself was difficult to control. Made up of troops from vastly different territories within the empire, it patrolled a land border that in the north went from the Baltic Sea along the Rhine and Danube rivers to the Black Sea. In the south, the empire was bordered by desert and the empire of the Sassanid Persians, who also occupied the eastern border. Only the western border was secure. As a result, the army was huge and was overseen by powerful generals, many of whom had imperial ambitions themselves. Another problem the Roman Empire faced involved people living just over its borders, especially Germanic peoples who were clustered along the Rhine and Danube rivers and who were being pushed from behind as more Germanic groups migrated into the European continent. A more or less continuous stream, beginning in the 2nd century CE, the Germanic groups were themselves being pushed by Hunnic tribes from Central Asia, who formed alliances with some Germanic tribes, and who eventually spilled into the European world in the 6th century, in a second great wave of migration. Managing both the population inside the empire and those just outside it presented huge problems for emperors, their administrations, and the army. The easiest solution came to be to invite Germanic groups to police their own borders, Certain tribes were invited into imperial territory as so-called federated troops and charged with defending Roman territory against other Germanic groups. As can be imagined, the system did not work all that well, although its effects would not be felt in the heart of the empire until the 4th century. When Alexander Severus, the last member of the Severan dynasty, died in the year 235, the problems with imperial succession, the ambitions of army generals, and the pressures on the troops came to a head. The cracks in the imperial system became chasms. What followed was fifty years of virtual anarchy, with generals being declared emperor by their troops, 
troops murdering newly declared emperors, the imperial administration falling into tatters, even the coinage losing its value because of the adulteration of the silver and copper used to make the coins. Although provincial governments centered in the Roman towns known as municipia tried to maintain order on a local level, the disruption of the Pax Romana became obvious to all. In 284, a strong man with an unlikely background who had risen through the army ranks to a leadership position was able to retain the imperial title conferred on him by his troops. Diocletian. Unlike his predecessors, Diocletian entered the job of emperor with a well-thought-out plan, which he soon began to implement. Diocletian divided the empire into two halves and further divided these halves into provinces called dioceses governed by imperial officials called vicars. He also appointed a co-emperor to rule one half of the empire, Maximian, who ruled the less wealthy western half. Each co-emperor, or Augustus, chose other generals as their adopted sons and successors, known as Caesars. Diocletian chose Galerius to succeed himself, and Maximian chose Constantius. This system was called the Tetrarchy. This system probably saved the empire for at least another generation. Diocletian also reissued the coinage, standardized weights and measures, and passed a law stating that sons had to follow the professions of their fathers. Farmers had to remain farmers. Shoemakers and wheelwrights had to be shoemakers and wheelwrights, and so forth, in perpetuity. Diocletian might have been an autocrat, but his system seems to have worked, and many of his innovations were preserved by his successors. The Tetrarchy, however, did not survive. Death and dissatisfaction with the system, after 304, led to another short civil war. When it was more or less over by 314, the last man standing was Constantius' son, Constantine. Constantine would take Diocletian's social, economic, and administrative reforms and rework them into an imperial system that survived for hundreds of years after his death. Constantine is best known for two specific acts, his legalization of Christianity in 313, and his rebuilding of the ancient city of Byzantium at the mouth of the Black Sea as his own personal capital, renaming it Constantinople. The legalization of Christianity, which had become an increasingly popular religion in the upheavals of the 3rd century, had few immediate effects, but by the end of the 4th century it would become the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. The city of Constantinople, refounded in 327 as the New Rome, was in some ways even more important to the preservation of the Roman Empire. The empire would continue to exist in the form of the Byzantine Empire, centered at Constantinople until 1453, when the city was conquered by the Ottoman Turks, led by Sultan Mehmet II. Between Constantine's death and the reign of Justinian, the Roman Empire experienced dramatic and far-reaching changes. As the center of the empire shifted eastward, the importance of keeping the Western Empire intact faded. Gaul, Spain, North Africa, Britain, and eventually Italy were invaded by Germanic groups who established independent kingdoms in each. The last Roman emperor of the West, the teenager Romulus Augustulus, was deposed in 476 and replaced by Germanic overseers until Theodoric the Ostrogoth was declared king of the Ostrogoths in Italy. Although Justinian had ambitions to reunite the Mediterranean parts of the Roman Empire, the western half was ultimately lost to other groups of conquerors. Justinian's reign marks the transition between the Roman and Byzantine eras in the history of Rome. Although he spoke Latin, the center of his empire was the Greek city of Constantinople. Everything about Justinian's reign looked forward to the Byzantine world that would follow him, with the past but a nostalgic reflection. The Roman way of life would survive in the East, but only in its Byzantine incarnation. The Roman Empire was a unique phenomenon in the history of the world, and the Roman family was no less unique. Since the empire was comprised of many different cultures, including Italian, Greek, North African, Semitic, Germanic, and Celtic, each with its own particular family and community structures, it is amazing to consider how effectively the Romans were able to export variations on their own traditional ideas about the family into the far-flung regions of their empire. The traditional Roman family could in some ways be considered a peculiar institution. It shared its patriarchal and paternalistic qualities with virtually every family structure in the ancient world, but it went far beyond other cultures' notions 
when it came to the role of the patriarch. In the traditional Roman family, the pater familias was the absolute monarch, ruling over everyone, not only his immediate family, but over married sons and their wives and children, over the servants and slaves, over foster children and wards, and especially over their wives. According to the earliest written legal code, the Law of the Twelve Tables, the pater familias had the power of life and death over all his children at birth, both male and female. Disobedience on the part of the familia could lead to death. Wives were brought into the family through a process known as marriage with manus, which made them effectively the legal daughters of their husbands. Similarly, girls born into the domus were distributed to other familiae through marriage with manus. This meant that, at least under law, girls and women were only temporary members of their natal families, and all associations with their parents and siblings or at least in legal terms, sundered when they married into another domus. The historian Keith Bradley has invented a kind of roadmap that helps to model the Roman family during its 800-year history. First, Roman marriages were always arranged by parties other than the bride and groom. The parents and sometimes guardians were in charge of arranging marriages. Second, once marriage with Manus became less popular, marriages became more easy to dissolve. Third, in part because of the ease of divorce, but more importantly, because of the dangers of childbirth and the sometimes significant age difference between spouses, men and women often experienced multiple marriages because their partners died. Fourth, generational differences between spouses could result in children of multiple generations, with younger children being similar in age to the offspring of older children. Fifth, Romans viewed marriage and procreation of legitimate children as social obligations, and people who failed to honor these obligations were considered selfish and antisocial. Finally, marriage promoted political, economic, and social networks that were valuable to the families arranging them. What this description demonstrates is that, even though Roman legal structures made Roman families appear to be radically different from those of other ancient cultures, in broad outlines, they were quite similar to most of their ancient neighbors. Families experienced a broadly diverse range of membership, affection, cooperation, and conflict, and this range is not often illuminated in the legal terminology of the Roman jurists. Like that in other ancient cultures, therefore, Roman marriage and the structure of the Roman family was male-dominated and was based on the need to develop and foster social and political networks, rather than on the modern-day ideal of two individuals creating a loving partnership between them. The traditional power of the pater familias and the exclusion of brides from their natal families that is so absolute in Roman law seems not to have actually operated in such extreme ways in day-to-day interactions. For instance, in the first century historian Titus Livy's early history of Rome, his famous episode of the rape and suicide of Lucretia involves her biological father, Spurius Lucretius, as one of the principal actors who revenges the crimes against Lucretia committed by Sextus Tarquinius. If Romans were used to daughters disappearing from the family's associations, then this episode would have made no sense to them. Clearly, the practice of marriage with Manius was not likely to have resulted in the cutting off of all ties to a bride's natal family, as has been demonstrated in some depth by historians such as Suzanne Dixon. By the time of the so-called social wars, indeed, the practice of marriage with Manus was going out of fashion, replaced by a form known as marriage without Manus. In this form, the bride retained her biological and legal associations with her natal family and entered her husband's household as a kind of resident alien, connected to her new domus but not a part of it. Marriage without Manus certainly had advantages for both parties. Unlike marriage with Manus, which made divorce almost impossible to obtain, because wives could not be returned to their natal families, marriage without Manus was easy to dissolve should spouses decide to divorce. Finances were kept largely separate, with wives retaining at least nominal control over anything they might inherit from their natal families, and their dowries were not allowed to be used to pay the husband's debts or frittered away without the husband being assessed a penalty. Wives had the added protection of continued intimate and legal connections with their fathers and siblings 
so they had people to whom they could go in cases of abuse or neglect. Husbands did not have to worry about setting a large portion of their estates aside for their wives, since they were provisioned from their own father's estates. They also had the bonus of political and social associations with their wives' families, ones that might have been lost in the earlier system.